from Brady. Thank you, Brady. Is it possible to determine the difference between someone who has backslidden and who is a false convert? Hoy, is that a big question? Let's define our terms. What is a false convert? Somebody who did not rightly repent and put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. In, in other words, they were never saved in the first place. What is the definition of backslider? Eh? There's a loaded question for you. Biblically, I do not see that it means somebody who made a correct profession of the Lord Jesus Christ, wanders off into unrepentant sin for a decade, but then returns to the Lord, having believed in him all along. However, I do believe the Bible tells us that there can be people, sheep, who go astray, who for a season they aren't living in keeping with their profession. It might even be a pretty gross sin, or it could be something that they are just not aware of, they're not dealing with, but they're not behaving in keeping with being a believer. Is there room for that in the church? Yes, there is. Now there are times when church discipline must confront that we'll use the term backslider, in order to alert them, alarm them, and bring them back into the fold, or to kick them out, identifying them as an actual goat who needs to get saved. That is the purpose of church discipline, to deal with somebody who is a backslider. Unfortunately, these days, evangelicals have kind of reworked the definition of backslider. This is somebody who made whatever sort of profession of faith, probably doesn't matter much. How they're living, well, no big deal. What does that look like? Typically, it's something like, well, Jimmy got saved when he was eight, and he lived for the Lord for at least six months, but then puberty hit, and Jimmy went his way through high school, through college. Finally, when he was 32 and he had kids, he started going back to church and he returned to the Lord. Was Jimmy ever saved? Well, of course, this is where it gets tricky, and this really is the essence of the question from Brady. The reason that we've got to get our definition straight, though, before we dive into the heart of the matter, is to make sure we don't get confused by having incorrect understandings of what a true convert looks like and a false convert looks like. Those are better terms to use to get to the issue. How do we know? How do you know when somebody is a true convert or a false convert? And if you quickly just go, psh, psh, here's how, hold on. I would like to suggest you put those guns back into your holster and slow down a little bit before you start firing away. This issue can get a little bit more complex than just, oh, you committed that sin, you're not a Christian anymore. You gotta be really slow in working through this determination. How do we know if somebody is true or a false convert? Let's start out with their conversion story. Do they have one? Is it sound? Is it orthodox? Do we see a changing of affections, their entire will, once in bondage to the devil, now being controlled increasingly by the power of the Holy Spirit? Does somebody have a correct conversion story? Of course, that issue alone has a little bit of subtext. We will keep that off the table for the moment, but let's start with a true convert has a true conversion story, and then their life progressively should look more and more like Jesus Christ. Not perfectly, not instantly, but progressively. That is where it gets tricky. Let's say now our convert in question has a correct story. Their life has been increasingly fruit-filled, but there's now a sin that is inhabiting their life. Can that happen? And the answer to that is, Yes, yes, it can. I know that might give you the heebie-jeebies. Well, there you go, being antinomian, letting people get away with sin. No, this is not about letting anybody get away with sin, but it's recognizing we're simul justus et peccator. We're justified, but we're not perfect yet. And a Christian can have a sin start to take over their life increasingly. And that's probably the moment that Brady is looking at engaging in. 
How do we know? And the answer is only through time, only through an examination of fruit, and only if the person responds correctly to confrontation known as discipline. It may or may not be formal, but it should be a confronting, a discipling. Hey, did you know that this is going on in your world? What's your reaction to that? And that alone is going to be telling. The false convert's going to be, go away. Who do you think you are? Quit judging me. This is no problem. I've got this. Uh-oh, that's a bad sign. Now, does that mean they're not saved? Not immediately. They, they might respond that way sinfully. Don't we all tend to do that when we're confronted in our pride-filled states? And so you give it some time. You bring others to that person. You perhaps initiate a formal church discipline process. And as you go, you're praying like nobody's business that the person in question is actually going to repent, start behaving the way that they say they're believing. And if you will, return to the Lord whom they never really left if they were in him in the first place, which is probably the second issue that Brady is looking at in his question about false conversions and backsliders. The person who is genuinely saved doesn't get lost and then return to the fold. You don't become a sheep after being a goat only to become a goat for a little while and then become a sheep again. You're either a sheep or you're not. What do we do with all of that? And oh, so much more that could be said on a very important subject. Time. Give these things time. Don't rush to judgment. They are inevitably complex. Furthermore, we need to work on the Holy Spirit's timetable of conviction. We need to let him do some of his work. You and I are the instruments in the Redeemer's hands, patiently calling the straying sheep to come home. Are there more things that I did not discuss? <clears throat> Every situation has about 10 truckloads more of things that need to be dealt with and pondered. And that is why you and I should be concerned about helping somebody understand if they're a true or false convert. We should indeed lovingly get engaged if we see some sinning going on. But as we do, we lovingly take the time and we don't make a rush to judgment. All right, gentlemen, second half. Here's the strategy, Psalms, imprecatory Psalms. Now take a knee. Let, let, 